Uh, and actually, uh, yes, I'll try to make up. Uh, I'll try to make up a little time on this since we are uh, running a little behind. So, um, so Rob, you need to slow. So, uh, <laughs> so what, what I'm going to give you is an update on some of the tools emerging from MobyDAC. And uh, the the issue with all of the stuff is, uh, you know, people ask where did MobyDAC get its name. The issue is that uh, you know many of you have this issue with a whole lot of data. And if you're using last year's tools, you're over here. And uh, what you're hoping is that this year's tools might um, get you into a better situation. So, um, so, so anyway, as, as is very familiar to you, uh, our world is very much a, a, a microbial world. Um, I'm pretty sure Norm has shared this yesterday, so I won't get into it. Um, and this, of course, includes the uh, environments we build for ourselves. Um, uh, it's also important to recognize that only a tiny fraction of microbes can live in captivity, right? So uh, most of the rest of them we have to uh, sample out there in the wild. And so uh, the way we do this is by direct, um, a direct environmental sequencing um, as pioneered by Norm Hess's group. Uh, however, the drawback to that uh, is that you get all these sequences back. Um, you have to take an explicitly phylogenetic approach in order to get uh, good results out of those sequences. And uh, you wind up with these. Um, you, you wind up with all this data. So uh, what, what I'm showing you here, uh, and those of you who have been to this meeting before have uh, seen this example before, is uh, is a project that we did with Noah Ferris Group a couple of years ago. And just to uh, just to show you the scale of the problem, yes, the first of the hundred and thirty thousand, the first nine of hundred and thirty thousand sequences we collected in this project. Uh, yes, the first zero point one percent of the file containing the phylogenetic tree. Uh, and here's a naive visualization of the tree if you just open it and treat you. And you can tell immediately that you've got your work cut out for you, right? It's very hard to uh, understand the data in this format. So uh, anyway, so it doesn't even help you that much if I tell you what we were trying to find out. So we were doing a, sorry, did you want to, <laughs> were you trying to photograph this slide? Well, it's all being recorded. All right. So. Um, yeah. So, so, so anyway, so uh, what we were trying to look at was my geography, but uh, not on the scale of the 19th century explorers, uh, like Darwin and Wallace, who uh, mapped life out on the continent scale, but rather much closer to uh, much, much closer to home. So we were asking things like, uh, you know, does the space bar have more kinds of microbes on it simply because it's larger than the other keys? Uh, the keys are desert, where few microbes survive compared to the lush valleys of our fingerprints. Um, and is there a Wallace line, uh, a biogeographical dividing line between the G key and the H key? because they're right next to each other on the keyboard when you type on them with opposite hands. And these kinds of basic biogeographical questions are to a large extent exactly what we're trying to get at uh, in a built environment, right? Like in this room, uh, do we see dividing lines based on things like uh, proximity to light, uh, proximity to sources of moisture, uh, places where people walk, and so forth? Can we, can we tell how the microbes are spatially patterned? So anyway, uh, another view of exactly the same data I just showed you makes the main things going on in the system immediately clear. So now which point on this plot uh, is a microbial community, either from a fingertip or a key. Uh, if I call those by subject, um, you can see the first, the second, and the third person, um, all of their keys and all of their fingertips by person form a very nice cluster. So we can say something about the transfer back and forth between our microbes and our environment. Uh, we see very little separation between keys and fingertips from the same person. So in other words, each of us has a unique skin community we transfer from our fingertips to our keyboard as we type. Uh, we also showed as part of the same study that you can match the palm of someone's hand up to their computer mouse with up to 90% 90, uh, 90 accuracy. So this came out in PNES a couple of years ago, but more importantly, it was on CSI Miami, so you really know it's true. <laughs> uh, so how do we do this? Well, what, what I showed you is a principal coordinates plot based on unifrac distances between communities uh, calculated using CHIME. Uh, so CHIME stands for Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology. Um, and uh, we, we started development of this uh, in my lab uh, in 2009. Greg Caparasso, who's, who's here, if you want to uh, wave to everyone, Greg, um, is, uh, it was, was the lead author on the paper and is uh, really leading the development effort in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, contributions and so forth. And, um, and, so, uh, and so it stands for quantitative insights into microbial ecology. Uh, the goal is to turn all those sequences into pictures that you can understand into statistics that would convince your reviewers. Um, and so, uh, and, and so basically, uh, basically the pipeline was intended for is tagging 16S genes uh, with DNA barcodes, uh, mixing the samples and sequencing them in multiplex, either on 454 or Illumina. Uh, don't use Ion Tyrant for obvious reasons. Um, and then because each sequence has a, has a barcode, we can tell where it came from. So we clip them off, align them, 
build phylogenetic trees and use that phylogenetic clustering uh, to look at similarities and differences among samples. Um, however, you can also use time right now uh, for ITS and for ATNS and for any marker gene sequencing. Um, you can, although this is a very early development, uh, use it for shotgun metagenomics as well. Or if you calculated shotgun metagenomic data by some other means, you can import those tables into time uh, using something called bioinformat biological observation matrix, and then use all the downstream visualization and statistical tools. So, um, so, so one, one of the key questions facing us as a community is this issue of data integration. Uh, because you get much more out of combining studies than you do out of uh, doing your study individually and looking at a small number of patterns uh, as, opposed to com uh, as opposed to patterns that, uh, from, from data that we as a community are producing. And um, so to a large extent, uh, what's enabling us is a consistent set of standards, uh, such as those produced by the, uh, the Genome Standards Consortium. And, um, and, and so the goal is to be able to capture all the data in a consistent way uh, that, allows us, um, that, that allows us to figure out what's going on. Um, so uh, one thing that's in development at the moment, and um, and it was just submitted to uh, to, to ISME recently, um, is this uh, is this metadata standards package for the built environment. Uh, so this is called MixBE, um, an extension for defining minimal metadata for the built environment. And so this is something that Lynn Shrivel and uh, Elizabeth Class have been doing a huge amount on. Uh, Lynn, you're in, uh, yeah. So Lynn, could you identify? And um, I don't I don't think Liz is here, right? No. Yeah, so, um, so, so anyway, if you want to hear more about this, uh, talk to Lynn. But basically, it's, it's been submitted to ISME at the moment. And uh, what, what it does is it basically puts together a set of metadata uh, that you can use to describe your built environment samples in a consistent way. And as soon as the reviewers finish tinkering with the standard and like what we want and so on, uh, we will be making this available both through Chime and uh, through MAMS, which I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, to, for, for use by the community. Um, and so uh, basically what it does is it, uh, it stores in standardized ways a whole lot of the type of information that you would like to collect about the built environment. So, um, so, so what, what is MobyDAC, uh, you might be asking. So what, what it was, uh, was, a phone, uh, was a sign funded collaboration among various databases. So the components were, so the components at the beginning were Chime, uh, which I develop, uh, BAMPS, which is um, uh, so a <coughs> database which I develop. Uh, VAMPS, which Mitch develops. Um, Mitch, you're here in the audience somewhere, right? Yeah, so, so Mitch is over there towards the back. And um, FungiDB uh, was developed by Jason Stage, uh, who's, who's not here. Uh, and MG Rest, uh, developed by Paul Meyer, who's also not here. Uh, we had planned to do submission through MG Rest, um, but that turned out to be less effective than, uh, than what we had hoped. What we're currently recommending um, is that you do uh, analysis either with Chime, uh, with the standalone package, or through the database, uh, or with BAMPS, uh, or, or with both. So, um, so let me uh, let, let me just show you a little bit about. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit about where you can find them. So, uh, so with the Chime database, uh, basically, if you Google for Chime, part of the reason we picked this name is that it's essentially unique on Google. So uh, the second link here uh, is linked to the Chime database, and um, you can just sign in with login and password uh, and use it. Um, with Vance, um, I, I realize I'm taking a bit of a risk here, uh, but you can just Google for it. But it does in fact uh, come up with top of search results in Google. So what you want is uh, vance.mdl.edu, uh, not the other choices. And, um, and and so uh, basically, uh, basically you can log in there. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna uh, I'm, I'm gonna uh, skip most of the demo of this. But you'll notice that there's a bunch of things that you can do within uh, within the map site, including, for example, uh, including, for example, uh, running Chime on, uh, on on particular data sets that you pick out, and then so I'm just grabbing a couple of data sets are arbitrarily, and when I carry this forward. Uh, so, so one, one thing you can do on the so one thing you can do on the BAM site uh, is is basically uh, tinker with all of the parameters for how you do the analysis. And one of the differences in the capabilities between the sites is on BAM gives you a lot of control uh, about how you do the processing. Um, uh, uh, um, and so that can be useful if you're trying to uh, do something specific uh, for a small set of samples. Um, on the Chime database, we focus more on providing a consistent, standardized pipeline 
uh, so it's possible to compare many studies together in one combined analysis. And so that, that's one of the differences in philosophy. Uh, both sites offer a fairly wide range of visualization tools of the and the ability to uh, integrate your study with other studies. Um, so just moving forward a bit, uh, one, one thing that's great about uh, having, having this kind of database is that you can start doing all kinds of additional things like, for example, source tracking to uh, pin down sources of contamination. Um, uh, so uh, so this, is, this is something that we uh, developed with Scott Kelly, uh, Scott's here in the audience, so, uh, down on the front there. And so, uh, so what, what this lets you do is basically take a new environment and partition out the kinds of communities um, into the individual component environments. And you can only do this if you have a fairly extensive data set of known samples where you know for sure where they came from and what they are. But this can be really useful for tracking down uh, errors of different kinds and, and sample handling, uh, contamination, that kind of thing. Um, supervised classification, which is another thing that, uh, you know, that, that Dan developed when he was in the lab, he's now a factory member in Minnesota, uh, is, is, that, um, is, is that it can be really useful for detecting mislabeling. So where we came across this initially, was in a study we did with Reef Waste Lab on infant development, where uh, what we saw, um, so what we expected to see was this relatively smooth gradient from the early samples towards the late samples and the adult samples. And so there were these three very puzzling late time points that looked very much like the early time points. And part of the reason, and so we were so suspicious of the, of the way they didn't fit with the overall pattern, that Reef went back to the freezer, uh, chiseled off a few additional specimens of the feces, resequenced them, and after resequencing, they fit back in with the pattern. But basically what you can do is you can train a classifier uh, based on the overall pattern, the use it to detect outliers that are very suspicious. And, um, and so, uh, and, and so uh, what, what's great about that is even if you have substantial amounts of mislabeling, if you train a classifier based on the overall pattern, um, you, can, you, uh, you can recover a lot of those errors and reassign the samples. So here, uh, the, the intentionally mislabeled samples from the keyboard study um, are, are, are red. Uh, what you recover uh, is um, what, what you can recover by label correction has been um, has, has been highlighted here, right? So you get essentially everything right, uh, even if you have quite a lot of noise in the data set, and certainly far more noise than you would expect from experimental error. But the key point is that you really need to look at your data rather than just running statistics on it directly, or you wouldn't realize any of these problems. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, so, so, just to illustrate some of the value of combining data sets. Uh, I'm going to uh, say a little bit about where our microbes come from in the first place. And if you have dogs or kids, you probably have some dark suspicions about that, <laughs> which turned out to be completely true, by the way. But, um, uh, so, with Marie Larry Dominguez uh, at the University of Puerto Rico in um, San Juan, uh, actually, she recently moved to, to NYU. We did some sampling of the microbiota within 20 minutes um, after birth, and then uh, and then babies, uh, sorry, then the mothers an hour before birth. And so basically, if you come out, um, if, if you come out the regular way, all of your communities look like vaginal communities. Uh, if you're delivered by C-section, all your communities uh, look like skin communities. And Scott and others have shown that this is also uh, that the skin community is what you get by default in very clean settings, such as NICUs and so on. If you try to keep it really clear, uh, what you're going to get by default uh, is, is a small smattering of skin microbes. Uh, and here's another view of the same data showing, um, showing association between the uh, vaginal samples in red, all the habitats from the vaginally delivered babies, uh, the skin samples in blue, all the habitats from the C-section babies, but the mother's oral community has been very separate. Um, you can also use these kinds of techniques in outdoor air. So this is another, um, this is another of those studies um, led by Bob Bowers. Actually, I just spotted an hour in the back, so uh, if you could wave to everyone, it would be great. Um, so, uh, so, for, so this was a this was a great example um, of, of, of using source tracking because basically the idea was to look at how uh, how air changes in summer versus winter, and so uh, what we did is we matched up to a database of, of fecal specimens, soil specimens, and leaf surfaces, and uh, regrettably in the Midwest and Detroit and Cleveland, um, especially uh, in the winter, you don't have the main sources you expect, right? So there's no there's no leaves on the trees. Uh, the, the lake's frozen and the dirt's frozen, right? So uh, most of what's left over is a fecal signal, uh, primarily from dogs, which is, um, uh, which is perhaps unfortunate. Um, and this is another, uh, another of those studies looking at uh, the value of, uh, so, so looking at the value of source tracking, um, but also of uh, doing this kind of spatially explicit representation of data, uh, which I think Jess uh, Green also showed you in the BioBU project. But when you can spatially localize the data and also spatially localize the sources of the data, 
you can understand a lot more about what's going on. So for example, we see a very clear soil signal on the floor, I would hope, but also interestingly on the flush handle, uh, we have apparently a bunch of people who flush it with their feet rather than with their hands. Um, and, uh, and then skin communities on things like the door handle, uh, like at home, but also on the toilet seat. Um, and uh, just coming back to that micro, that, that infant development series, so uh, where we have this very, uh, very clear gradient uh, between the um, between the meconium uh, uh, over the first uh, over the first couple of years of life towards the mother. Uh, but this is kind of interesting. But what you'd really like to do is you'd like to integrate with other samples, such as, for example, uh, all the uh, all the samples of the human microbiome project. And so, uh, and so Antonio and Yoshiki uh, figured out how to uh, how, how to do this. Um, and uh, let's see, Antonio, you're here, right? Yeah. So Antonio is over there. So so what, what so what we're doing is we're um, uh, so what, what we're doing here is we're taking that one infant time series, integrating it with the rest of the data set. So it starts off. Uh, so this is still when it starts off looking like the vaginal community, which you might expect from what I showed you before. So we're just using all of the samples from the Human Microbiome Project as a data frame to interpret uh, the, the changes in this one individual. And so you can see initially a lot of uh, back and forth with inoculation from the skin um, and, from the, uh, and, and from the vaginal community. And it's starting to develop uh, more towards looking like the stool. Uh, but you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's, not the steady, it's not nearly the steady progress that you might have expected just by looking at these, rather, uh, at these relatively smooth curves. And then uh, coming up here, uh, what we have is really cool. So the, so the kid gets treated for a neuro infection with antibiotics. You see this radical change. Um, and then you start to see a return. Uh, and then finally, by 27 months, what you're going to see is you're going to see them returning um, and come, uh, finally developing and maturing to look like an adult stool sample. Right? So you can't see any of that just by looking at the one study alone. You can only see that by placing it in the context of other data. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that and uh, just mention that combining studies uh, can be really hard due to the inconsistencies in the methods used. Uh, so, for example, um, so, so for example, when you look at different studies like the HMP uh, with different primers, um, and then uh, different sequencing platforms, uh, different populations, and so on, uh, what, what, what you often see is you see clustering by study. And one thing that we as a community really need to address is how to overcome. Uh, and, and so, this is something that other uh, communities, like for example the microarray community, have successfully addressed in the past, uh, is how to overcome this per study clustering and figure out how to get enough consistency between methods or at least a good enough understanding of the systematic biases in those methods that we can project data collected one way into a data set and data collected, the, uh, collected in these other ways. Um, however, despite the fact that it's really hard, uh, it can still be really cool. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to, uh, to, to show you how to, um, how to do the analysis in the Chime database. And, um, and so, so this is something that especially, uh, especially Doug and Dale uh, have put a huge amount of uh, effort into on the, uh, on the development side, on the metadata side, but also a bunch of the other developers are, are, have also contributed a whole lot of effort are here also. So for those of you involved in the database development, um, a sort of a wave to the audience. There's Doug and uh, there's you. She, uh, sorry, I didn't realize you were here. And uh, Gail is the person who'll be helping you with metadata when you're trying to get the studies in here. So what we can do is basically create a new meta-analysis. Uh, which we can just uh, type in the name for. And uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the stuff I, um, I talked about. Actually, I realized I skipped, skipped over this. One, one thing that Gail's really been leading is this, um, is this project looking at uh, the Komodo dragon microbiome, which is potentially really important for conservation. And uh, also, um, uh, and understanding uh, why it's difficult to reintroduce them into the wild. So uh, this is Ben Tang, who's one of the Komodo dragons down at the Denver Zoo. Uh, we were only allowed to handle the juveniles ourselves. The uh, the adults were about six feet long, and we weren't allowed in the enclosures. Although we were allowed to sample from the enclosures. So uh, anyway, so uh, if I do something like, um, for example, grab the uh, let's see. Uh, I grab the restroom biogeography study uh, that I showed you before, and then also grab the uh, Komodo dragons and their environment, uh, which is just down here. 
Uh, so, so you can see there's a bunch of metadata in there, and we get that at the interest of time, just can grab all of it and uh, make predictions based on all of it. Uh, so you can, you, uh, as, as you can see, there's thousands of studies um, in here at this point, uh, covering tens of thousands of samples. Um, so basically, if I grab those, I'll just do a 3D PKA plot, which I think most of you are familiar with, and start that going. Uh, what this is doing is it's running on our cluster uh, over, uh, over in the BioFrontiers building. And um, so uh, the first step, uh, what it's going to do, so at the moment it's queued uh, in the queuing system, and when it starts running, uh, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to generate a BIOM format file uh, that has the OCU table um, and also a file for metadata. So that usually, so that should just take a few seconds to complete, usually. There's always a risk of running demos. Uh, So, so while, while that's running, I'll just uh, I'll just move on to uh, some of some of the conclusions, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. So where, where we are currently um, is that uh, what what you can do right now uh, is you can analyze sequences uh, right now both in uh, and in BAMS. Currently, you have to do the upload separately, although Doug and Andy are working very hard, uh, and Andy is in um, as I mentioned, that we're working very hard on getting the data integration seamless so that you can uh, send, send data from one to the other directly rather than by intermediate steps. Uh, the 16S pipeline is fully implemented um, separately both in Chime uh, and in BAMS. Uh, you can also process 18S or ITPS data in BAMS. Uh, you can also do it using Chime outside the database. So you can do it, um, so you can do it with a command line or you can do it by using Galaxy, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is something that provides a, um, a, 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 something that provides a, a graphical interface to it. And Jose Navas, who's uh, not here at the moment, I think, has uh, done, done a lot of the work on that. Um, in both Chime and, both, and, and Advance, uh, but currently separately, uh, you can integrate data from a whole bunch of different studies. So I'll just check on progress. So where we are now is we've got the mapping file and the OTU table, and you can download any of these just by clicking on them. And what it's doing now is it's running, uh, running the visualizations. So, uh, so you can use both Chime and Advance to uh, do this kind of integration. Advance is currently somewhat more interactive. Uh, Chime allows you uh, uh, a somewhat different subset of visualizations. Um, and then you can deposit data including 16S, 18S, ITS, and Shopgun uh, in INSDC, so that's a collaboration that includes GenBank, uh, EBI, and, um, and DDBJ, so basically making your, public, uh, making your data public. Uh, you can do that very easily via Chime, uh, it's just one click if you've got everything, uh, if you've got everything straightened out with your deposition. Um, so what we recommend is current best practices. So for 16S, um, uh, uh, we, we recommend the EMP protocol, uh, which is the 515-806 primer set that picks up most of the uh, most of the archaea and bacteria with relatively even distribution, as a number of groups have shown independently, uh, which provides the best results and comparability currently. Uh, one thing that's interesting is it turns out that it's much more important where you sequence in the 16S than how long the ramification is. Uh, I think Norm showed you yesterday a couple of counterexamples to that where sometimes having a long read really matters, but you're much better off having a short read of a good region than a, than a longer read that's more taxonomically biased for most applications, although not for all applications. Uh, for the EMP protocol, uh, we've had a lot of success using the MobileCat for uh, environment samples, so especially, um, uh, especially Donna and, and Greg and Matt in my lab have used this successfully for uh, thousands of built environment samples by this point including things like, say, if you took a Q-tip and swabbed the wall and ran it through that kit, you'd probably extract enough DNA to sequence. Um, currently, what the ChimeDB allows is it allows a default reference pick to pipeline where you get to match up to what's already in green genes. Um, if you want to test alternative parameters and alternative ways of doing the pipeline, you should use Chime outside the database, or you should use MAMS. Um, and then uh, if you're going to publish the results, if, if it's not true that almost everything hits what's in the reference database, uh, you should use what's called the Red Plus De Novo OTU Picking Protocol, uh, which Greg developed. Uh, what it does is it matches to the reference database everything you can match to the reference database, and then does De Novo clusters with what remains. Um, so you should do that if you're, if you're missing a lot of sequences that you probably want to pull in. So if only 30% of your sequences hit the database, you probably want to figure out what the rest of the stuff is in there. And uh, what we're recommending right now is using Curtis, uh, Curtis Hutton House Managed Genomic Pipeline uh, for, for shotgun analyses. Uh, however, we're working on both integrating that into Chime and into the Chime database. And Greg is also working on a direct uh, shotgun pipeline with some alternative ways of mapping 
uh, that will be in uh, will be in China itself in a robust form fairly soon. At the moment, that's a preliminary version. So if you Google that China Genetics tutorial, you'll see something online on what you can do currently. Although it's improving very rapidly, and so uh, while, while we'd certainly welcome feedback on how it performs at the moment, it will get a lot better in the near future. Uh, so switching back to this, uh, we've got so we've got some plots, and so um, I, I just uh, I just did the three D three D PKA in the interest of getting something really fairly rapidly. So what I'm relying on now is Java not to screw me. Um, which uh, so so one of the, so um, so so unfortunately we, uh, we we currently rely on Java for this. Although uh, Antonio and um, Yoshiki have been working on a really uh, and the have been working on a really nice tool called Emperor, uh, which replaces this Java visualization. But basically, what you can see is uh, we've already uh, we've already got some plots here. For example, if you want to do something like um, and, and as you can see, there's a uh, there's, there's a ton of information in there. So, for example, if we want to do something like uh, look at what came from the feces versus the saliva uh, versus the skin, uh, we can do that fairly easily. And one thing that's interesting is we also have a whole bunch of uh, so we also have a bunch of built environment and stuff. You can see that some of that clusters separately, uh, but a bunch of it's uh, looking fairly close, uh, looking fairly close to the uh, skin distribution. Right, so not only do we, um, as humans, exchange skin microbes with their environment all the time, uh, the, true, the, the same is true for other species, including reptiles. But, uh, but, but you can do this sort of thing very easily uh, with a few clicks in the database. And uh, just, just to show you really quickly what's coming in terms of visualization, uh, this is Everton, which is currently running on my laptop uh, in a virtual box, although, uh, although we're currently in the process of hooking this up to the database. And so, uh, so one, one reliable question that comes up all the time is how do you power your study? How do you know how many samples to collect? And, uh, and the, the issue is that no one knows, right? Because if we knew the answer to that, we probably wouldn't have to do the study in the first place because so much is known about the environment at this point. But what we can do is we can take other studies that we think are comparable and ask if we have fewer sequences or fewer samples, but we get the same result that we got in the study. Uh, so, for example, if I uh, rerun the keyboard data, so this is the data as it was published in the paper, uh, I can do things like uh, recolor this, for example, by, uh, by, by, the, by the name of the subject. So, uh, and uh, I can also do things like, uh, like control the visibility separately from that. Uh, so, for example, if I want to, if I want to uh, turn up independently what's from the surface or what's from the skin, I can do that pretty easily and you can see how difficult they are. Um, but then, uh, the, the other thing you can do is that you can just say, well, what, what would happen if I ran on, let's say, 400 sequences per sample? What would happen if I only had 15 samples per subject? And then what if I repeated that a bunch of times? Would I get the same result? And would I be able to draw the same conclusions? And this takes about 10 minutes to run, so I won't uh, force you to sit here doing that just to be happy. But, uh, but it just gives you an idea that you can dynamically do this sort of thing on the fly and figure out at least if your study was similar to some other study that's been done, would you be able to draw the right conclusions with the sampling that you propose to do? Um, okay, so, uh, and then where are we going with this? Well, um, one thing we're doing is we're doing tighter integration between time and banks, including uh, transfer of some of the best features among them. Um, we're in the process of adding the ITS and ATMS pipeline to China. Uh, one development that's very exciting uh, is that within the group, and this is, uh, this is an effort that Scott made suggestions to have really been leading, um, is uh, standardizing on some ITS-1 and uh, ITS-2 primers. We think we need to standardize on two primer sets because in the regions where ITS-2 works, uh, you get much better representation of some taxa. The drawback to it is that it fails, at least in our hands and in the hands of several other, other people who have tried it. Um, a lot of the types of samples you'd want to look at, like for example, the skin of your subjects, uh, the swaps from the walls of your buildings, that kind of thing. And so as a result, uh, the, the current goal is to do both a standard ITS-1 primer set and an ITS-2 primer set. And then later as the amplicon length increases, we should be able to bridge between them. Uh, additional reference genome sequencing um, through FindJDB is also going to be really important there. Um, this, uh, we're doing tighter integration between Chan, uh, the Chan database and other tools like Evident, uh, which I showed you, Emperor, Site Painter, which I just showed you the demo of, uh, sorry, showed you the static image from, from uh, Noah's bathroom study, and so forth. Uh, the ability to do those animations, like one I showed you directly from the Chan database, is again something we're working on, which should be really exciting. Um, one, one thing I know a lot of you want to do is cross-level analysis, like say, relating uh, fungi to bacteria 
or a related taxonomy to expression or uh, to shotgun metagenomics. We can do that outside the database currently, uh, but we don't currently have the infrastructure to do it uh, directly on the lab in the next couple of years. Um, and that mentions adding to balance a bunch of stuff on non cluster based analyses, including oligotyping um, and then minimum metric decomposition. And so uh, some of those are available in BAMS now, uh, some of them will become available in the near future. Sorry? Just tie up. Yeah, sure. So this, this is the last slide. Uh, one, one, thing, one, one thing we're still working out is communication about rapidly evolving methods. So we're going to continue to communicate these through micro.net. Uh, there's workshops like the Stamps workshop, which I think many of you are going, are going to or have been to in the past, that Mitch runs. Uh, there's various Chime workshops as well. Uh, there's a Chime forum where you can get help from once time for BAMS. Um, we, have, we have some funding from Polar for Chime developers and BAMS developers to visit your site and help you with your uh, data analysis. So if you're interested in that, you should contact uh, me or Mitch. And then if you have any other suggestions for effective communication, we'd appreciate them. So with that, I'd like to thank a large number of current and former people in my lab, um, yeah. a whole bunch of collaborators, and uh, most, people have, uh, uh, most people I've asked to, uh, you know, I, uh, most people I've coached to through the talk. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks for your attention, and um, I'm delighted to take a question or two before coffee. study uh, sort of unpublished with Dan on the source tracker we found that um, you know not very many but a few of the HMP samples were, were highly contaminated and sometimes we found out that it was mislabeled um, but sometimes it was just this proportion and it seemed to me it would be really important in situations like that for your for your source communities to get rid of that if you're going to use that as like this is what the healthy human microbiome is but you've got a bunch of samples in there that have you know, you know skin contamination and gut it seems like either you should eliminate that few samples or or just take out the sequences from them. What, what is your thing? Can you repeat that? Yeah, so Scott was, Scott was saying that on the HMP, uh, we used that source tracking technique on the entire HMP data set and found a whole lot of things that we didn't like in that data set. Uh, that, that actually did get, um, I, I realized all the conference calls were really boring in a long time ago. Uh, that did, in fact, get, get fed into the HMP QC pipeline and we excluded those samples. From what was released, uh, so um, so the HMP so the HMP release data is clean of those, and also there were a couple of other QC steps that were used to exclude samples. Uh, but you're exactly right. Uh, when when you see the results of either the mislabeling analysis or uh, or the source tracking analysis, and you you see things you really don't like, uh, you know you really want to exclude those. So um, so so actually for the whole body study we did uh, the Blitz Castello was the that was the lead on a few years ago. Uh, we found um, we, we ran one plate that was uh, we, we ran one plate at four by four where the whole plate was about ninety seven percent pseudomonas. So in that case, um, which was not what we wanted, right? So in that case, it's just obvious that you have contamination. You should throw it away. Uh, what we we're hoping to help you with is to get down to the less obvious cases where you might not just see it immediately the way you could uh, if, if you just have a whole lot of uh, pseudomonas in your reagents or whatever. Okay, uh, well let's move on to coffee then, but certainly uh, feel free to uh, grab me during the rest of the conference and um, I'd be delighted to answer more questions.